Hello and welcome to this presentation on the Euphoria API. In this presentation we will be taking an in-depth look at the Euphoria API and how to integrate with Euphoria using both the API and WebSockets. So what is the Euphoria API? The Euphoria API is an XML based interface into the back end of Euphoria. And this allows you to perform two main functions. One is to get information and the other is to issue commands. And when I mean get information, I mean that you can ask the system by constructing an XML string to retrieve information like call detail records or call recordings. So this is a typical get request and that re follows by a response. That response would be the data that you've asked for. Another typical example is to issue commands and that might be to establish a call. So you construct your command and you pass it through to the API and it will perform this, the command. Euphoria however is not event based. This means that the API can ask for information like the last few call detail records. It can be even asked for real-time information like the status of a queue, the status of a member in a queue, the status of your current calls and all those kind of things. And like in a command you can also ask the API to establish a call. You cannot however ask the API to do something say when a call comes in or when somebody is put on hold. The API is not tied into the eventing system of calls. This is where we use WebSockets. So the API is very good at getting information out of the back end of Euphoria like call detail records. It can get real-time information and it can be used to issue commands like setting up a call. Well, what exactly does API stand for? Well, it stands for Application Programming Interface. And as the name suggests, you would use it in programming. In other words, you'd need to build an application that makes use of it. It uses XML. So, a typical example is the actual TMS.Euphoria.Cosa or the agent manager. So every time a command is used inside the TMS, these commands are issued to the API and this information sends the request and retrieves the result. I can even get real-time information, calls, extension statuses, etc. Another good example is the agent manager. I have that running here and here you can see I have something similar where I have queues, I have statuses, I have all this information all retrieving it from the API. I can look at my call history and I can retrieve the details of my call detail records over here as well. So this information is coming from the API. Now you might be asked if the API is SOAP based or REST based. So no it's not. We've built the XML API as a custom XML based request and response service. It's not based on SOAP and it's not based on REST. But you do have to, have to construct the XML in a specific manner in order to get the response. Well, where is it and how do I use it? So, the API is hosted on a URL much like the rest of our website and the URL is as follows. I have that up as well and I can show you that if you simply go to the API URL it will simply say 
input XML not loaded. So basically it's waiting for you to put your XML request in so that you can get a useful response. Now we use Fiddler as a good way to test this because Fiddler is an application that can, allow, can construct an XML string, issue it through to the system, to the API, and get a response. So, I have some sample responses over here. This is a typical request for the queued calls, right? Here you will see, starting with an XML version and encoding tag, I have my outer XML document element. I also have my tenant and authorization block. This tenant and authorization block, along with all this other information, is required on every call to the API. I must also include an action name. If I omit the action name, the system will not know what I want. So I can, for example, issue that, and the system will say my action is not defined. Right? If I put my request in complete, under action name, I need to give it one of the applicable action names. I can't just give it anything I want, otherwise the system will not know what I'm looking for, right? I must give it a useful action name. I can't get this wrong, it cannot be with the wrong typo or anything. It must be according to the action name documentation. So now the action name documentation is stipulated here in the help documentation. If you go to the support URL, the Euphoria support portal, click on solutions and you will find your way to the API documentation. And this document is called the API action name reference. Inside the action name reference you'll have all your typical requests. So here's another good example of one where it's actually specifically constructed as the test action name. So I'm going to put this in here as my action name, do nothing. All right. This is the least information I can give it. So I will submit it through to the API and responds with the correct response, which is nothing done. All right? And we will see that as being documented over here. Response, nothing done. So the other example I was looking at earlier on was to get queued calls. So you will see that we need to construct the, with the action name get queued calls and queue name as specified there. Please note that you don't put the dash and the tenant name into your queue name because it will retrieve the queue name from the XML request. There is already my tenant name over there. So get queued calls takes my queue name without the dash tenant name. I issue the command to the API. You will see there's the response and there's the XML response. All the information sent to me, I can view it as raw where I can see I have an outer XML document element, I have a queue parameters and a queue members. All right? You can issue commands at the API and see what the responses are like and program around the responses. Right, so that is a typical way of testing the API and making use of the API. You issue an XML request and it gives you an XML response. So how do I get full integration though? I mean great, so I can get information but how do I do something when a call comes in? This is where the other form of integration comes in. This is called WebRTC. And WebRTC is, well, it's a collection of technologies. And it enables you to perform real-time voice and video con communications. WebRTC, quite simply standing for Web Real-Time Communications. So the WebRTC system subscribes to the actual SIP messages that are passed between the server and the client. The client in this case now becomes your web browser where typically it would be the phone on your desk. 
So what WebRTC does is it can actually subscribe to the SIP messages, pass information between the server, the PBX, and your browser. So now as you can imagine, when a call comes in, your browser can listen for these events like a new call or a pause or an unpause or hold and it can react and you can program whatever calls you need to do into that event system. So there's one small limitation to this and that is it's predominantly browser based. So as it, the name st says WebRTC means that it's predominantly going to be technology based on the browser. However, most integration development requirements are based on CRM systems and they are already browser based so it's already suits. Well now what's missing? So it seems like it's all there. With the API you can get information you need even real-time call statuses. You can even issue a command however with WebRTC you can catch the events in making a call. That's for example a call gets set up or hung up. But now what's missing? How does this all fit together? Well this is where the SIP call ID comes in. The SIP call ID is a unique code that's generated by the client device. The client device in this case is of course your telephone which is the browser in the case of WebRTC or in fact your desk phone and it passes it to the PBX. When the PBX writes the CDR the SIP call ID is written into the CDR so that you can retrieve the exact call based on the SIP call ID that you still have in your browser. So when the call is complete you can access the CDR and which, which will include the call recording based purely on the SIP call ID. Typically this would only be possible if you matched up the call history with calls that you may have placed or received based on the caller ID or the destination. Now this is seen as a inaccurate matching process. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to give you a way of exactly pinpointing the call that you made because you set up the call. This is the technology that closes the gap between the PBX server, the API and your client side application. If you for example were building a CRM system you would keep a collection of your SIP call IDs of, of calls that you might have made or received. You can then tag or add extra parameters to this call or store it in your database. And Then when it comes time to retrieving that CDR from the API for the purposes of the call recording or whatever the case may be, you can specifically retrieve that call. So the API is great for retrieving information. The WebSockets is great for subscribing to the event-based system of the, of, the, of the telephone system. It will in fact be the actual telephone. And the SIP call ID is the element or the glue that sticks the two together. It is the way for you to tie up your calls that you might have retrieved and stored on your side with the data in the database that is retrieved by the API. There is a lot of information in the documentation over here which allows you to browse through all the different calls that might be required from your application. There is extensive documentation on how to use the API, how to obtain an API key, the action name reference, testing the API, which is where we go into the same description as the Fiddler, same example as the Fiddler example. 
Another integration option which we can look at on the solution home page is the WebRTC. You'll see it at the bottom. We have using Euphoria with WebRTC. Getting started, you'll notice what we we go through some of the specifications technical specifications on WebRTC. You will notice that we connect on port 443. It is a secure connection and we use HTTPS. All these elements will be important to you when you construct your SIP based, your, your um, WebRTC based SIP phone. You can see how here this article takes you to the various libraries. There is SIPJS and JSSIP and these two offer different strengths one is more simple and however lack, lacks some functionality the other one is a lot more complicated but is more fully featured in this article over here you will see getting star started we've got some SIPJS samples where you include the two libraries and over here you can build the phone GUI. The phone GUI is a typical sample where you can put your server name, username, password and register and call. And there is the handling script which allows you to construct the registration user agent. All this information again is set correctly for secure web sockets port 443. You would provide it with a username, password and server. And with this you can construct your phone and the sample is over here. Thank you for um, spending the time. If you have any specific requests around the API or specific um, questions that need answering around uh, the API and the action names or something that you might require you're welcome to email us at our support email and we can give you a specific answer however this presentation should include everything that you need to start building your integration with Euphoria. Thank you.